Welcome to today's Textile Talk. Um, I am Martha Seelman. I'm the Executive Director of Studio Art Quilt Associates. Studio Art Quilt Associates, or SAQA, is one of the five organizations who organize these textile talks. And it's been my privilege to be uh, bringing you one of these talks every few weeks. So today I have the immense privilege of introducing you to Judith Content and her new work. But before we get there, I want to invite all of you to consider attending SAQWA's conference, which is coming up at the end of April. It's April 29th to May 7th, and you can attend from anywhere in the world because it's going to be virtual this year. We have some really exciting keynote speakers, Janet Eckelman and Jim Arendt, we have a student panel who are going to be sharing their work. We have Kedra Navaroli, who's going to be talking about mending the narrative for textiles in art history, and a lot of other exciting opportunities. If you go to www.sakwa.com and look for events, Bridging the Gulf Conference, you can find all of the information and we would love to have you join us. So today's program, I've known Judith Content um, since she was on the board that hired me to be executive director back in 2004. So we go back a long way and I've always been a huge admirer of her work in part because she really likes blue and that's my favorite color and she's inspired by water as am I. So it's always been um, something that I look forward to is seeing what she's up to most recently. Judith has been exhibited all over the country and the world. She was featured in Craft in America's um, segment about quilts, um, and um, she's had several museum exhibitions, most recently at San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles and the Visions Art Museum down in San Diego. Um, and um, I've been fascinated to watch how her work has changed over the years because I follow Judith on Instagram. And so I get sort of blow by blow of what's going on. And whenever somebody says, oh, I just started using Instagram, I say, well, if you want to look at something beautiful every day, you need to follow Judith Content. So um, I, if you're not following her already, I encourage you to do so. Um, because even when she isn't posting photos of her art, she's posting photos of things that she sees on her daily walks. And so you see all sorts of beautiful nature and flowers. However, over the last couple of years, um, her art has taken a really big change. And I knew it was a big change when she posted that she completely reorganized her studio space 
in order to be able to work on this new body of work. And so I asked her if she would be willing to come on Textile Talks and share with you how that change happened and how she sees it evolving in the future. We're going to put on, in the chat um, Judith's list of resources and the different locations that she's going to be showing you where she is installing her art. And they are on <clears throat> the SACWA website with this textile talk. And they will also be, when we put it up on YouTube, that those resources will also be there. So uh, Lucy just put it into the chat and you can um, click through. And, and that way, a lot of those questions that people have, you've got the answers right in front of you and they're not gonna go away. Um, so I want you to just sit back, relax, and enjoy this journey into Judith's art and how it is evolving and emerging over time. Judith, you're muted. You need to turn on your microphone. I've only watched 400,000 of these, you think I'd know. <laughs> but here I am, everyone. Welcome to my studio. And I do want to thank Martha Seelman for this invitation and Lucy Shaken for her unbelievable expertise behind the scene. I sent her images and she is the one who presented them so beautifully to you. So I'd like to welcome you to my studio in Palo Alto, California. And I took this slide about a year ago maybe maybe a year and a half ago. And it's a time of transition. And it is showing in the lower right-hand corner, the last piece that I, the last wall piece that I've created since the pandemic started. And then behind it, a little further in, you'll see a table covered with a white uh, a towel. And that's where I'm starting to do embroidery. So this is a time of transition. I'm finding the embroidery to be very therapeutic, very mesmerizing, and a way to take my mind off the beginning of the pandemic. The piece on your right is called A Firestorm, and it was destined to go to the exhibition called uh, Shadow Dance at the Visions Art Museum of Quilts and Textiles, curated by Charlotte Bird. And I um, got everything there on time, but within, a week of delivery, it turned into a online exhibition, as did pretty much everything I was doing, including um, exhibitions just simply being postponed and canceled. So after this piece, I, I put away my wall pieces for a while, and it's not something I did deliberately or really thinking about, but I started to do it. And as uh, Martha said, my studio transformed from a Zen space with white walls, white design wall, white floor, a very tidy, almost nothing out of place to something almost cozy, which is not something I've ever really called my studio. But I was so fortunate to have a studio in my home during the pandemic. I had friends who, whose public spaces were closed and they were up in the air, but I have a studio and it's a short commute from the kitchen. And it's my, it's so an, an oasis. It's a, definitely a place of refuge. And so this is where I started to work on by hand. And uh, let's take us to the next slide. So the real focus of my work for the last 40 years has been the process of Arashi Shibori. And Arashi Shibori is one of many, many, many different uh, traditional Japanese resist dye techniques. And I discovered Arashi Shibori, excuse me, in 1978 at San Francisco State University. I had moved to California very, very abruptly as a senior in high school uh, in 1975-ish. And that was a wonderful move. Don't misunderstand me. I met some wonderful people, but it really disrupted my college uh, plans. So I bopped around for about two years, taking all of my general ed, which turned out to be a fortuitous 
uh, process because by the time I arrived at San Francisco State, all I had to take was art. And I took every art class they offered from jewelry to sculpture, ceramics. And as a senior, I just stumbled on the textile department and it was like coming home. And Candace Crockett was leading a surface design class and who should come into my surface design class for a one hour demonstration, but uh, Annalisa Hedstrom. And she did a beautiful process of an adaptation of a Rashi Shibori on PVC pipes. And it was just, I was, uh, it was a light bulb moment. So I immediately went home to try to practice and I didn't have PVC pipes, but I had broom handles and mop handles. And those are the, um, uh, the forms that I did my earlier uh, dyeing on. Graduated to wine bottles. And then here I am using the ABS plastic pipe that I use today. It is impermeable to heat, so it doesn't warp in a hot dye bath. And I love um, working with it. It's hollow, so you don't have to fill it with water to submerge it. And so I pour the dye over the surface of the pole and the pole has been, um, silks are secured to it that have been pre-pleated and wrapped with ribbons, thread, thread, string, whatever. Next slide, please. And here's my studio and here are some poles. And this is the dye of my choice. I do use other dyes, but um, Miyako Zome dyes, um, are now called eco, uh, Miyakozome Eco Dyes. And I had first purchased them in a tiny little shop in San Francisco called K Hashino. And it was a wonderful little shop. And it sold these little, as you can see in the center of the slide, these little tiny jars of dye. And they are very light, fast, very easy to use. And the colors are like jewels. And they overlay beautifully, layer upon layer upon layer, creating beautiful, beautiful um, nuances of color. And I have a question, the poles are ABS plastic pipe. So um, these, these um, silks are wrapped and dyed, and then they are unwrapped. Next slide. And the sources of inspiration for me and for my dyes, I would say water definitely is one of the first ones and water in all of its manifestations, fog, and snow, and lakes, and streams, and the ocean. And this is Little Crater Lake in Oregon on your left. It's not Crater Lake, but it is inspired and called Crater Lake. And next slide. I'm especially fascinated by ombre uh, colorations in almost anything you can find. And in this particular case, it's, an, it's a, a piece from my succulent collection. Next slide. And I'm inspired by things even at my feet. And these are the tiny pebbles, uh, which is essentially the sand at Rodea Beach at Fort Cronkite, uh, the National Recreation uh, Area, north of the Golden Gate Bridge. Next slide. I also subtract color in a discharge process. And in this case, I purchased commercially dyed silk. And I have all this information in, in the chat in, in, or on um, the uh, Sakwa website. But in this case, it's Thai silk. And I've intricately pleated it. I've wrapped it on my ABS poles, secured it with thread. And in the case of the upper left, you see an actual leaf. And that is an olive leaf from my garden, which will create a resist too. So the, um, the discharge, I use just micro, micro amounts of, of color remover, tiny amounts, less than a half a teaspoon in a simmering water. And it takes hours and hours and hours to discharge the black into these creamy colors. You can't go quite to white. And that way you create levels and layers and intricate patterns. If I just put a whole package of RIT color remover and submerge my poles, it would all discharge away and there'd be nothing left. And I know this for a fact. Next slide. So again, the sources of inspiration for my silks are often colorful, but not necessarily. And I love the foggy nuances of the beach. And you can see here the lines of the silk on the right. 
I'm trying to get a, an effect almost like calligraphy on the silk. The next slide. And then I also use raw silk, which has a wonderful pebbly sandy surface, not unlike the sand at the beach on the, on the San Mateo coast. Next slide. And this is one of my most recent wall pieces. Um, I began my career doing multi-storied uh, site-specific installations in Silicon Valley. So we're, we're talking two and three stories. I also um, did um, wearable art right out of college, but I have been focusing on wall pieces now for a good 30 years. And this particular piece incorporates both the dyeing that I showed you before, the, the dip dyeing, as well as the discharging in the, in the center. And I have actually used magnolia leaves for that abstract look of the leaves. And this piece is called Firefall. And the, as the last two pieces were done, we are in a pro, prolonged drought. Fire season is now it looks like it's going to be all year round and it's it's a real concern for those of the people that i love and and the environment so though my pieces celebrate the beauty of nature they also they also celebrate or bring attention to the things that um is a danger to the environment such as receding uh, glaciers climate change glacial um ocean rise and drought Next slide, please. However, at different stages in my career, I like to do irreverent things and I like to do things with my scraps. I never throw anything away. There's no scrap too small to, to keep. And at one point, they started to look to me like chocolate and a dark chocolate, light chocolate, milk chocolate, all kinds of chocolate. And so this piece is called Bittersweet, Bitter, S-U-I-T-E, and it led to quite a collection of chocolate-related pieces. And these were in my exhibition at the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles um, a couple of years ago. And I went on to do sweets of all sorts, French sweets and bonbons and um, Japanese um, sweets called uh, wagashi. So that was a fun little episode. Thank you. Next slide. But I'm a rock collector. I'm a beachcomber. I, I, I keep coming back to the shape of rocks, and I'm not sure why, but my father brought me a handful of polished agates when I was about three, and I think that was another light bulb moment. Next slide. So I started making rocks just as at another point where I needed to do something a little bit more irreverent and a little bit more lighthearted. And the rocks on the left are raw silk discharged and they are stitched with um, a vintage cotton thread that's really heavy weight. And the ones on the right are playing around with the ombres and as yet they are they are unstitched. And now I should mention that right about this time, this is the pandemic now, there is not a lot happening, but there was an online Sakwa exhibition called Land Art and uh, it sounded really intriguing. And I thought, huh, what could I do? What, what could I do? My wall pieces didn't seem appropriate for this purpose outside, but the rocks did. Next slide as well as colorful rocks. And these, I wanted to note, are inspired by polished petrified wood and carnelian and agate. And I wanted to include it because in this case, the silks are uh, stitched, machine stitched prior to be made into a sculpture. The others are made into a sculpture and then they can be stitched too. And I use an archival watercolor paper uh, heavy, heavy weight, the heaviest that they make, cut into um, organic shapes. Um, the silk is stitched around the edge and then drawn around and under the, um, the paper and stuffed with a polyfill for body. Next slide. So I made many, many, many stones. Uh, 
the nice thing about using the scraps is those wonderful little areas that are just perfect and you can cut them out and again creating something of an ombre. Next slide. The colorful stones I found were more, they were easier to create a composition with. I, for some reason, they just worked together. Perhaps it was the color and the way that they could be juxtaposed. I'm also working with different sizes and 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 in those juxtapositions. So I have some nice compositions I'm really happy about with the colorful ones, but the black and white ones, they just never did anything for me in, in the studio. Next slide. But I thought, why not bring those to the beach? And I put them on the beach and it was like they were at home. It's so, it was so intriguing. I, I didn't anticipate that. I didn't really know what they'd look like, um, but I put them around and I thought, hmm, they, they look okay here. And so the next slide, I started to install them in the crevices and the outcroppings. This particular beach uh, is just south of Pescadero on the San Mateo coast. It doesn't have a name, so we call it our beach. And it's just a simple coastal access with a parking along the street and an overgrown path to the beach. The thing it did have was these amazing outcroppings and tide pools. And the uh, tide pools were always a safety net for me. They completely kept any of the big waves coming into shore. So it was a safe place for us to bring our daughter when she was, was young. So we've been going to this beach for as long as I can remember. Next slide. And then I started to take my black and white rocks with me up and down the beach. And we, we usually went to the beach about once a month, but now we're starting to go there uh, like once a week and uh, having a great time. So I lined them up on this uh, the crevice on this cliff and then on the log. And that's down um, just uh, north of Point Lobos. Next slide. And then I thought we need to bring the colorful ones in the game. And uh, they did start to look at home in different locations. Um, in the case on the left, they are nestled into the roots of an ancient oak tree at Bartholomew Park Winery, which is now a privately owned public park with amazing trails up into rugged, rugged Sonoma hillsides and also right on the vineyards. And then on the right, I was walking through the Presidio and I, of course, am mesmerized by Andy Goldsworthy, but I'm trying to do things as as underivative as absolutely possible. And so I came across this um, drainage ditch and I just put them there. They, they really resonated to me there. And then I, I realized that they brought back a very poignant memory from growing up in Massachusetts. We lived in a very rural little town called Harvard and the nearest grocery store was Lemonster, I believe. And we had to drive over a creek. And I remember Sometimes a creek would be red, and sometimes a creek would be blue, and sometimes a creek would be yellow. And as a child, I thought this was really cool. And then as an adult, I realized that there was a factory upstream dumping pollutants into the water. And then 1972 came the Clean Water Act, which regulated the discharge of pollutants into the waters of the United States, and the creek was clear. So that was a good day. Next slide. Well, okay. I will back up here just slightly. Uh, during the pandemic earlier, for, for quite some weeks, I don't remember exactly how long, all the beaches of Northern California were closed to the public. And if you went out there, which we did just to see, there are no parking signs as far as the eye could see. And in every every pull out along the entire San Mateo coast. But getting towards Labor Day and the deadline of the online show is looming, we decided to go to Asilomar and I wanted to use their pristine white um, 
beaches for an installation. And I also wanted to, um, I wanted to install in a, uh, an environment with rack lines. Rack lines are the feature, a, a coastal feature at the top of the tide line, and they consist of seaweed and sea bracken and insect pods and um, grasses and everything that washes up in a tide. And as a beachcomber, you can find amazing things there. And I just love rack lines, and they're the sign of a healthy beach. Well, the day before we were going to Isilomar, my husband came out and he had this look on his face, it doesn't sound good, and he said they've closed Isilomar for Labor Day. Uh, and I was like, oh no. We decided to go anyway. There are other places besides beaches to install, and I figured something would turn up. But we got up really early in the morning and we came down to the beach, and this is the sign that we saw. And it's actually good news. This, the beach is closed, but not completely. You are actually allowed to walk and bicycle, run, swim, surf, and social distance. The things you can't do are sit, stand, or lay down. And there was a, a ranger who I felt so sorry for telling people to stand up and move around. It was just, it was just like twilight zone. Next slide. But there is no sitting involved in doing my installations. They are an active form of exercise. And I am a happy camper. And I had brought every single solitary one of my colorful rocks, my black and white rocks, and everything. It didn't work so good to do the rack line again at the high tide zone. But I found this incredible um, crevice in the rocks um, down, it's called Del Monte Forest, so it's a little south of Asilomar. Next slide. And this is the piece I created. And uh, it's in an ombre of sizes and colors, and I have them just tucked in with the seaweed. And since there's a lot of human de uh, detritus in a rock line litter, they, they again seemed right at home. And next slide. I got into the show. I was really thrilled. And you could see it on the, on the Sokka website. So that was encouraging. And next slide. I continued to outline interesting forms at the beach for a little while longer. And then the next slide. I continued again, closer, close to the water. I especially love really close to the water because then the waves come in and wash away my footsteps, which are not what I want to have part of my installations. Next slide. And in thinking about other forms that you can find at the beach, I thought of bubbles. And on the right, I never even had a chance to take a photograph of this installation before the waves washed it out to sea. And that's the only one that came back, at least right away. Most of them did come back eventually. And I have to say that the archival watercolor paper was warped in the most beautiful way. So there you go. And the silk doesn't get harmed by water whatsoever. Uh, next slide. So I thought, well, another solution would be to do my installations towards the way back of the beach, way far away from the, um, uh, the waves and where footsteps won't show up. And this is at um, Rodeo Beach at Fort Cronkite. So I had just started to do kind of like a labyrinth piece and I had no idea I'm being watched. Um, I usually, these things just send me into, a state of nirvana. I, I am oblivious. If somebody walks up behind me, I, I have to control myself and not shriek. But I all of a sudden heard all these people going, oh no, over and over again, this chorus, and a wave came up and washed it all away. So most of them again came back. We walked down the length of the beach and they came back one at a time. And again, they weren't harmed, but at this time, I started to think about them in another way besides rocks and creatures at the beach. Next slide. And they started to look like mushrooms to me, remarkably. And so I started to think about stems 
and stems would, would um, be very secure in the ground. And these are, these are catalpa pods. I thought, well, that would make a good stem. And they do for one use and then they crumble and that's that. So next slide. I just sourced bamboo right from the front of my studio. And here I have, I like to keep a whole lot in um, stock, slender and tall and taller and wider and I cut them. And next slide. I'm starting to make larger and more complex and definitely more colorful uh, installations. And because they're going to be seen from a distance, I decided not to spend a lot of time with the surfaces. I just wanted the colors. And I sorted them this way to see how many I had of each, each color combination. And obviously blues are my favorite and I needed to create more in the warmer tones. And so I did. Next slide. And here's the bottoms of the stems. And you can see the the bamboo being inserted. These were not necessarily going to be for sale. These were just going to be used as often as possible in installations. And so they needed to be sturdy. And so I'm using waterproof glue and I'm sealing the paper and creating um, a literally, I think I created something like 300 uh, originally. Next slide but how to get them where they need to go. They are a lot um, trickier to travel with than just the little tops. And by this time, we're taking hikes deep into the Santa Cruz Mountains and along rugged creeks and into um, all kinds of different rural uh, public land. And so I created a bag, which is made of tussa silk, and I actually improved the shoulder straps since this photograph was taken, but it has a pocket for my mask and for my gloves and anything else I might need. Next slide. So the first location I went was not where I intended to go. There's a lot of serendipitous opportunities for doing these installations. And my where I wanted to go was a beach really close to the Pigeon Point Lighthouse, but the wind was galing. They were, even with the sticks, there was no way they were gonna stay in the ground. So we drove south towards um, Ana Nuevo and the wind died down somewhat. And then we saw this uh, grove of cypress off towards the coast, right, right at the water's edge. And we decided to go out there and that might have a little bit less wind. We got there and what we found were these black stumps. And we looked at the hills behind us and they were burned um, just as far as the eye could see. And we realized that we had approached the uh, area where the CZU lightning complex fire of the year before had burned through the Santa Cruz mountains and right to the sea. And it was very moving. But I think, um, I think of mushrooms as a source of um, renewed growth. And so it was almost a celebration because you can see that the grasses are starting to come back and life will resume. And that is a hopeful sign. Next slide. And then this is back at our beach, the coastal access. This is on a day when I'm there with my daughter and her husband and our grandchildren. And they had the best time inserting these in the ground. And then they went off to do their own thing. And I created this um, installation at, at the edge of the pool. And one of my favorite um, things that happened on that trip is my daughter saw it and she was like, Ellis, Ren, come look what, look what Nana did. And I was so, I was so proud. Next slide. And so these are actually at Mallard Pond in San Francisco and they're tiny, tiny. They're less than an, half an inch across. And um, next slide. And also tiny ones at Bartholomew Park again, a private park. And I'm starting to be fascinated by um, 
fairy circles now. There's something about the composition of a fairy circle. It, it feels um, comforting and it's an enclosure. It's the inside and the out. And I just find that a fascinating composition to explore and to get this. Um, usually I'm doing an actual photograph of the just the installation, but I realized as I walked to get a different angle and look back at the installation, I could see the vineyards in the fall color in the distance. So I got way down on the ground and photographed through and waited hopefully for the sun to come out before it set to get some good light. Next slide. So the beach and the coast has been an inspiration to me for, for my wall work and for all my work for as long as I can remember having moved to California in 1975. But sometimes for these installations, I get to the beach and I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know, I don't know what to do first. I have, I do my own photography. I use my iPhone. I have a full battery. I, I'm ready to go, but you want to do the best possible composition you can with the battery and the stamina that I have. And so this day was one of those days. And I had wandered around and I'd looked at the boulders and nothing was appealing to me. Uh, the next slide, please. But I walked far enough to find this little waterfall. And it is in the video, I believe, and you can see it on my Instagram, but it was the last thing I expected because we were in a drought and it was in the middle of the summer, which is the foggy time of year. And it was dripping down and it created a perfect circle of damp sand. So I outlined it and I started to, um, for the first time, notice the shadows. And again, for the photography, I take as many photographs as I possibly can. You can't take too many because there'll be one, maybe two in there. That will be just what I'm looking for. I do a lot of cropping. Next, next slide, please. And so here I'm essentially drawing with my, with my, um, my sculptures and I'm fascinated by the slender bamboo, the various angles. It has kind of uh, an undulating line to it and also circles playing with the shadows, playing with the vertical nature of the um, sculptures themselves and the horizontal nature of the waves and the horizon line. I'm considering all of those. It's, it's, it's an all-consuming thing to do. Next slide. And another photograph similar to that. Next slide. And this is also when it starts to occur to me that these are almost as happy in the mountains as they read as mushrooms as they are at the beach and read as some kind of exotic sea creature, whatever that might be. Next slide. And then my thread started to holler at me that it was, um, building up on this thread wall. It's what I've been using to do other sculptural work. It's all nylon and polyester, very fine weight, vivid colors and lots of variegations. And I thought, why not start to really explore surfaces for my sculptures? And next slide. So that's what I started to do. I've been embroidering since I was in high school, but I hadn't done it um, really seriously in a long time. And just like I do anything else, it's really simple stitches and it's the colors and the combination of the colors, the juxtapositions, warm to light, blue to orange. Each one's unique. I start at the outside edge and work in and I, I just start to add the color that I think will resonate the most and then the next one and the next one. And hopefully they resonate. If they don't, there's a little seam ripper that I use. Next slide. And so I found that these were very comfortable as mushrooms in the, um, in the brush. Next slide. And almost immediately they started to read to me as jellyfish. 
And this used a whole nother source of thread. And these are sea lawn and all this information is on the website um, and you can order it online. And in this case, I just used vast amounts of it and sewed it onto the underside of the stitched sculpture. Next slide. And they became quite elaborate with um, uh, beads and um, threads and um, stitchery. And these are unplied to have that kink from heavyweight Ceylon. Next slide. And then I started to take them to the beach. And for videos, especially, um, for videos, especially, um, the uh, the the filaments of this of the um, jellyfish are are really magical, and I think they're even more magical when they get soaked in a wave. It doesn't hurt them at all. Next slide. And I wanted to include these two slides of installations at um, the beach at at uh, Rodeo Beach. And it is a beach in Fort Crockheit, which is very different than a Silomar, which is granite and very, very pure white. This beach has elements of basalt and volcanic and metamorphic rocks ground up. And uh, it had been um, a volcanic region many, many millennia ago. But the rocks are very dark, but I think they're fascinating um, against the uh, sculptures. And the next slide. And then this slide is from the other direction. So I spend a lot of time moving back and forth, trying to capture elusive and wonderful juxtapositions of, of the sculptures for the photography, because this is the only way that they'll be documented. They are temporary. They're only there as long as I photograph them. Um, sometimes I'll take a break and have a snack and look at them. But for the most part, I gather them up and use them again at the same location. Next slide. And these are another example of how they stand out in different environments. The sand on the right is at Pacifica in uh, Northern California. And the um, slides at the left are again down at Asilomar in the granite. And um, the ones from the right are, were from an amazing event. I actually went out with two friends and we did installations together in Pacifica, um, members of my critique group. And it was an interesting experience for all of us to see ourselves at work and um, what we wanted to create. And none of us had ever been, um, Connie Teagle and Deborah Corsini. Um, Connie and I had never been to Pacifica, uh, Deborah lives there. And so we were in a new environment and it's fun to see what we came up with. It was really windy. That was great for the, um, the fibers. Yes, these do remind me of jellyfish. Next slide and a close-up of the stitching. I love how this photograph captures the essence of the waves and the fibers. And the fibers are a vintage silk. I found it at an antique mall. I'm not sure what they were used for, but they still have the Saracen. So they're very stiff and they're wonderful to work with. Next slide. Which leads me to, um, leads me to um, shadows. And these are something that's very fascinating to me now. Next slide. The round ones, the round shadows on the very smooth sand. The next slide, which made me think, what would square shadows look like? So I started to make all kinds of squares, different, different series, different sizes. I'm definitely stitching these because although I'm really interested in the shadow, I'm also interested in the sculptural surface. See if I can capture that. Next. And here they are at the beach, the squares, which I think it's really interesting. And again, it's drawing, it's using line. It's, it's not a brush or a pencil or a pen, but it's, it's a shadow. Next slide. And then I just wanted to mention um, the photography again, as related to the tides. I now pay a great deal of attention to the slide. I mean, the, the uh, tide schedule, because if it's really low, this is 
these are places that I can't get to ordinarily. So we watch for negative slide, uh, tides. And this is um, Gazos Creek, but down to the right, to the left, Gazos Creek is, is a sandy white beach. And to the right, it is a rocky, craggy beach. And this open tunnel just spoke to me. Next slide, please. And one of the benefits of taking 42 zillion photographs is every once in a while you get a composition like this one, where these birds look like they're in a conversation with my sculptures, which I love. Next slide. I'm also beginning to explore other forms. These have an internal core of archival watercolor paper with silk stretched over the surface. Next slide. And I find that these are as comfortable in the grasses as they are at the beach. And they read, they read as it's very different. And I think that's a fascinating part of doing these as uh, site-specific installations. Next slide. I'm thinking of moving indoors with them too. So new shapes, thinking of bouquets, thinking of sculptural installations indoors. Uh, the possibilities are just endless. Next slide. But again, I really love them at the beach. I really love what happens to them there. Next slide. I wanted just to mention quickly um, how wonderful it is that this, as my family has been involved with this project. Um, this is Little Crater Lake again, and my son-in-law, when he saw it, he said, I know who would love this lake. And when I was doing my installations, he said, when we were visiting in Oregon, we should go visit Little Crater Lake, which is in the Mount Hood National Forest. And it is an absolutely, it is not the same color as Big Crater Lake, which is indigo. This is more aqua. It is just gorgeous. And it, it was just such a thrill to have brought these particular pieces with me. Next slide. And this is my most recent installation. This was done at Monastery Beach, and it is a beach um, that is just south of Point Lobos, and it had a little pools that had formed it from, from earlier rains. And when I got to this beach, I realized that this was not a safe beach for me to do an installation at the water. Um, the, the um, sand is cascaded right to the edge and it's notorious for um, sneaker waves and, and to pull, pull you in. But the pool was just delightful. And so I did a, a, a picture, picture with these and yeah, the, the grasses and the twigs are all bare and my stems are bare, but it's the bluest blue day with white sand and everything just reflected blue. It was a wonderful day. Next slide. So I wanted to say in conclusion, the next couple of slides, that doing this project was, was an amazing experience for me to have to do during COVID. It was a, a way of getting out of the studio safely. It was a way to get exercise. It was a way to explore and to bring it to people via Instagram. Let me share it. And and let other people come with me on this journey. Not all the installations are great and I, I show them all. And um, it's been a way to make a whole new group of friends and colleagues. And um, I'm inspired by what I see on Insp Instagram and I'm thrilled to inspire people as well. Next slide. I also just want to mention in, in, cross, in passing that um, I only do my installations on private, I mean, I'm sorry, public, public property, but I also stay within the parameters that are safe environmentally. So installations that you see inland are on the trail. I don't go into the woods. I don't go off, off trail at all. So I'm limited by those opportunities. That's why the beach is so nice because the beach is accessible to California. We are so lucky to have that legislation enforced. Um, the next slide. I also wanted to ensure that no animals were harmed in any way during any of these installations. And the next slide is me 
I'm wearing the backpack, I'm carrying the mushrooms, they're in all kinds of bags, and I'm ready to go. And I just also wanted to say the trail went right through the center of these, 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 these trees, just so you, you know. But you've been a wonderful audience. I, I've seen a few um, wonderful comments. Thank you for this opportunity, Martha. I'd love to answer any questions you have. Well, we have lots of questions, and um, I just, this is probably the third or fourth time I've watched the presentation, and I'm just mesmerized every single time. They're just, they're, they're just breathtaking. Thank you. Um, Thank you so you much. You had asked me to um, remind you that you wanted to share some of the interactions that you've had with people co coming across you doing the installations um, beyond the one that you mentioned where they started floating out to sea. Yeah, I should mention that um, a gentleman who had been watching that actual episode jumped in after them, believe it or not. And uh, <laughs> he explained when he came out of the water with handfuls of little rocks that he was um, on leave from, from Afghanistan. Yeah. And uh, it was, and his girlfriend was furious at him because it has riptides there. But anyway, he, he couldn't have been nicer. <laughs> you know, I consider doing these installations um, a form of education in a sense, because a lot of people do come up to me and they say, are they real? <laughs> and I'm like, well, yes, but they're not <laughs> real mushrooms <laughs> or they're not, they're not <laughs> real jellyfish. And then the next question is, what are they made of? And nine times out of 10, people have never heard the word silk. And so it's an opportunity to explain some dye techniques, to, to, to just talk about, and also to do temporary art installations at the, at the coast. That actually resonates with more people than what they're made of and how they're made. That people, people seem to be um, learning something. I have run into mycologists that were actually part of the mycology textile talk lecture at the um, San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles. I have run into, I ran into an artist who had done an immense installation of crocheted uh, flowers at Montalvo, um, which is an art center in, in Northern California. And I go, you were the one who did the crocheted flowers. And she goes, you're the one who's doing the <laughs> rocks. So mm -hmm. some people see me working and turn around as fast as they can and leave as fast as they can. Mm -hmm. And other people um, hang around and, uh, and I do the installations with them watching. So it's always different. And my favorite is school groups and, and field mm -hmm. trips. Kids mm -hmm. love this. Yeah, well, what, what's not to love? You're you're playing with sand and rocks and water and art and um, and for for those of you who may not be as much of a nature nerd as Judith and I are, mycology is the study of mushrooms. Thank so you. So these are people who are mushroom experts um, who are seeing the installations. Um, so Judith, um, I have a lot of questions about. Um, the, the actual, how do you make it? Primarily, could you talk again, how you make the sculpture part? What is it stuffed with? What is it based with? And then how do you connect it to the stock? Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, here we yep. go. Okay. So they begin with my shibori dyed silk scraps. And I have actually not done any shibori dyeing in a year and a half. For some reason, it seemed very important to me to go to my stash. So I have my shibori dyed silk scraps, hundreds of millions of them. I take <laughs> them as small pieces, about so big. And I, sometimes I'll just stretch, I'll stitch around the, um, the contour of the circle and then draw it up like a pom-pom underneath the paper. And the paper is Arches uh, watercolor paper. It is archival and it's made of fiber and it is really, really wonderful even when it gets wet and it's very strong. It's stuffed with, um, I just use whatever fiber fill I have in the studio. I actually like one that's more of a polyester and it has more of a buoyancy, not one that can compact. 
And then they're very easy to um, stitch on. Here's one I'm working on. So they're very easy to stitch on. It's almost like your silk is in a, in a hoop. So it's taut. Mm -hmm. And then I use a very fine needle. I use for um, the embroidery of these, I've tried other things, but I'm only using 40 weight uh, polyester and rayon um, thread. I bought all of it online because it was um, early in the pandemic and the stores were closed, but um, there, there's a lot of them out there. Just Google rayon thread, but it's Superior, Madeira, Sulky, uh, Fantastico, Mettler, and I have them all. And uh, then they are, I for the under parts now, because I do want them to be very durable and very secure and beautiful, like to have a really elegant line. I use a kind of felt that's recycled from, from um, water, um, water bottles. Okay. And I'm not sure I put that in the chat so okay. I, I can do that mm -hmm. but you you can buy it at joanne fabrics and it it so it doesn't fray at all it has a beautiful for felt it has a beautiful beautiful sheen mm -hmm. and i can, hand can, stitch can, it. You, can you show us the underside that's one of the questions <laughs> sure. we want to know everything judith there you go so there they are and that edge is stitched no glue so you and can, so how do you get the stock to hold on to it that's complicated okay so let's say this part is done the stitching okay and the, there's little raw edges and so i will actually take the um stem i've cut the um the felt but it's way up here on the stem and i insert the stem into the um the fiber fill and I use the best quality um, carpenter's glue that they have and I also have like a, another piece of like a cardboard donut that it is inside and it all sticks together when 48 hours later that glue is dry then I slide the black silk down trim it because I, I make it bigger than it is and then I trim it and um and sew it by hand and even that's tricky because you have now you have a stem to contend with so it's always like how do i how do i sew this so a lot of times i'm sewing it with the stem over my shoulder so that's the best solution so far you mm -hmm. know i'm a engineer efficiency engineer type person so i'm always looking for a better way there probably is but that's what i'm doing right now um <laughs> uh we we always want to know how did she do it yeah um and um you've answered some of the other questions which is that you have hundreds of them at this point in time and yes. that they're all made from scraps from your prior art um and then the other set of questions has to do with the photography what kind of camera do you use are you planning installations because you think they will have interesting shadow effects and, oh. and you know how has using the camera to capture your art changed how you think about art well this is my camera this is my iphone and uh it's not the latest and greatest but it's it's not too far behind and i just love using it um i've had to I've had to um, improve my ability, the, the stable quality of my hands can't shake. And so I've been working on though that skill to take it as if I'm using a tripod, which is impossible at the beach and I need to get down and, but I take a lot of photographs. Um, there's one element I'm always watching for at the beach. If it's going to be a foggy day, the, those are days that will, the light will be best. It won't photo it won't uh, reflect off the top of my sculptures and drain all the color out which happens and so working in shadow or shade is is something i really love to do we've had an incredibly dry winter it we it hasn't rained here in more than a month and a half so i haven't had any fog i've just had color so i've had to adapt um i use i so i use the editing features when i get home a lot i do not use filters 
but I do crop a lot. So you can find amazing composition. Let's see, I've taken a big picture with a lot of sky and water. You can crop down to just the essence. Um, I will use the contrast um, feature to um, create more contrast between light and dark. I'm trying really to create what, what my eye is seeing rather than how this is affecting my artwork is, um, is still to be determined. Um, I, I still feel I'm at the very beginning of this, and I, 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 um, I love to work small, but I love to combine the small components into large scale installations. So that, that would be a real commitment in time, though, because these do take time to create. Um, but I'd like to work bigger. I'd like to do massive ins installations, and I'd like to figure out how I can do them inside, too, because... Mm -hmm. um, they're not necessarily permanent at all. However, I have a client right now I'm doing a commission for, and um, he's intrigued with uh, ca casting them in bronze. Ooh. So I'm sending him some samples and we'll see what happens. Well, Who, that, knows? Who knows? <laughs> that sounds wonderful. Um, I want to thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> Judith's work is on her website and it's on her Instagram account. You definitely should be following her if you want a dose of inspiration every day. And um, Judith is developing some of these available for sale. So if you would like some of the more flowery ones or I have some jellyfish, um, they are available for sale. Just contact Judith and please Tell all your friends about how wonderful this presentation was and that they can see it in just a couple of days when it goes up on YouTube. Just look for Textile Talks or go to sakwa.com slash Textile Talks. We really want as many people as possible to know about the phenomenal resource that these Textile Talks are because due to the generosity of our sponsors, they are completely free to everybody. Um, I want to encourage you to stay on this call for just a few more minutes. We're gonna show the video of Judith's work um, in real time at the beach and just relax and listen to the waves roll in. Judith, thank you so much. It's been wonderful. Thank you too. Thank you.